are many ways to make good looking rocks in your scenery. One of the simplest and easiest is to carve them from plaster. Today I have the pleasure of introducing you to Doug Fiscali of Foscale Limited, the manufacturer of many fine craftsman kits. Doug is going to demonstrate his technique for making plaster rocks. Take it away, Doug. By carving into plaster, we can get some unique rock shapes that we wouldn't be able to get with molds that would repeat uh, in, within a scene. We're going to use this simple palette knife, create some rock shapes, and then carve further detail with a simple X-Acto knife. Let's get started. Okay, the first thing we need to do is outline uh, the extent of where we're going to be working. So we can create some rock shapes beyond the portal here, and then we're going to draw this out a little further, just to give us an idea of where we're working. And we don't necessarily have to stick to that line, but it'll help us out a little bit. So we're going to take this one inch foam and we're just going to start cutting with the serrated knife and sort of mass out the basic shapes. And eventually we'll glue them in place, but for now we'll just mock up some quick pieces. And what this will do is uh, keep us from using more plaster than we need to. One thing you want to do is avoid some 90 degree angles like I had there, just to make it more natural. So we're going to bevel an edge like this, otherwise we'll have to make up for it with plaster and we don't want to do that. So we'll just take down some of these edges. And with a glue gun we can start gluing these in place. And over here we could use some of this two inch foam to get a thicker mass. Now we're going to have this gap here and we don't want to fill that with plaster so we'll cut another piece, fill that in. Now we're going to continue the plaster inside the tunnel so we're going to want something for it to grab to so we'll cut a small piece Okay, we have enough foam to start massing out our plaster, so we're going to mix some plaster. This is regular plaster of Paris that you could find in your hardware store. And we're using this because it's much easier to work with. It's very flexible. If you use other plasters, uh, they're going to be very difficult to carve as they dry. And we're just mixing this per the instructions, but what you really want is a consistency that's sort of like peanut butter. Uh, you don't want anything too watery. So if you do, it'll slide down the slopes of your rocks and uh, you'll be adding more plaster than you need to. So we're only mixing whatever we can carve in six minutes. Now we're using this flat pallet knife to apply the plaster. And it's going to look like blobs at first. And you do want to put it on kind of thick because what that allows for is carving out more material. Because if you just skim coated this, if you start carving into this, you'll eventually hit the plaster cloth. So to get some depth and undercuts and shadows, you put a little extra on than you would have if you were just skim coating across the hard shell. And you sort of work one while the other is setting up. And these curved blobs are exactly what you don't want. So as it sets up in a few minutes, we'll start to get rid of them. Okay, we're going to mix some more plaster while this sets up. Okay, this plaster you can see is starting to set up. So we're going to put some fresh plaster back here and let that get to drying. And then we can move on to carving what we've put down previously. So with our palette knife, we can start to flatten out these curved blob shapes. And you want to start to get an idea of what you're going for. And you're not necessarily creating a theme, but you want some understanding of how the rock got there in terms of uh, form and shape. And over time, you know, they start out as flat layers often, but then they buckle and fold. So we sort of define one prominent line, and it could be at an angle, it could be straight. But we just use that as a starting point, so we just cut into it with our pallet knife. And we're going to assume that this sediment was sort of had a tilt this way, and then after that they can break up. But this will be the basis for where we start. 
And then with the flat edge of the knife, we can further take down anything that looked like a plaster blob. And we can start making some smaller cuts parallel to the main cut. And again, these don't have to be precise. You don't need a ruler to do this, but they just need to be somewhat parallel. Now, one thing we need to do as we work is see the work. So to do that, we can use a, a china brush like this. These are very inexpensive. And just brush away the excess material. But the other benefit of using this brush is it starts to soften the edges since the plaster's still kind of wet. It uh, basically creates its own form of erosion, as it, you know, just how rocks are in nature. So it's a really good trick. So you, you start with this major crack, and then we have these sort of secondary cracks. And within the secondary cracks, we can start to break up these layers. So this is the layer of sediment over time. You know, you have one, two, and three here. We can break those since they've been settling and falling. And just like avoiding this crisscross grid, you don't want to create a pattern that looks like bricks. So you have to be kind of random. And you can also make undercuts. Now these undercuts would occur over time, of course, from the folding and cracking, but they also occur from water settling in one spot and then through the seasons, through ice and, and thaws, they break up even further. So you can kind of give some history to your rock work and it helps you helps guide you as to why you're making these these cuts and lines. And a lot of times a layer like this might crack this way and you can have it settled look like it's settled a bit. So make a defining crack across and then to drop this level you just carve away starting at the crack. And now we have this shift vertically in the surface and now that it looks like this went down or this could have gone up but adds a little bit more interest. So now we have these major cracks and major segments and these sort of secondary cracks. Eventually as it dries, which it has already, starting to set up quickly, we can make some minor cracks. And these are hairline fractures you're literally, there's hardly any weight in the knife, and you're just drawing, drawing them across the surface. Now you don't want too much of a spider effect, like broken glass. Just a few here and there. And what that does is create a uh, sense of scale. Okay, we're throwing down more plaster where we left off. And you want to carry this over to your dried area a little bit just so we can once it's dry we can blend it in a little bit and you'll you'll never notice the transition and all of this is not necessarily going to be a rock face in this small area here uh, dirt would probably settle there and you'd have some vegetation so that'll be blended in later and another benefit to carving your own rocks is that you could use a photograph and replicate an actual site um, and get it as close to po as possible um, just by massing out similar shapes that you'd see in the photograph and that's something that's probably a little bit more difficult to do if you're using rock molds. So now we, we're going to go back to our line here and, and reuse that as a guide to where we can go. We're just going to flatten this area out and assume this sediment went this way and sort of bent a bit and took the, to the curve of this mountain here. So while this section sets, we'll add more plaster over here. And you can see that it's a very quick process. And it's only uh, as long as it takes for plaster to dry. So when you first think about carving something, you might think in your head that it'll take a long time, but it doesn't. And if you're unhappy with some areas that you've worked on, it's very simple to quickly mix some more plaster, cover it up, and start over. Now we're going to make another defining cut here, carry it up. Now we can carry it straight through like this, but like we lowered the other areas previously, uh, this way we can change a different direction. And instead of putting the seam in line, we can move it over. And then we're going to use this line again to make yet another shift in the rock surface. 
I'm going to carve in, and this is why we add a lot of plaster, so we could remove a good amount. I'm up here, it's about a quarter of an inch deep now, this cut. If you're planning to uh, create some debris at the bottom, you could also save the bigger pieces and just keep them in a cup and we can color them later and then sprinkle them at the bottom so it looks like a talus. Okay, now we've taped the inside of the tunnel lining here to protect the stone surface that we uh, placed earlier. And this way we don't have to worry about getting plaster on it, but we do want to blend it in just enough to cover the edge and the seam. Now since the portal was blasted out, it should look a little different from this kind of rock because it wasn't there naturally. So we're going to try to make it look a little bit different. And one of the ways we could do that is carve some horizontal lines where drilling took place and explosives were put in to make the opening. So if this were blasted out, most likely they would drill in from this way. So we could use that as a guide for where our, our parallel lines will go. And you can just make them as parallel as possible. And just by brushing over those lines is enough to give it a sense of erosion and wear since they were put there. And you can see by this work that we've done, it's pretty seamless and it might be a little bit more difficult to do if you used rock molds because you'd have to stop and start with sections and hope they blend it in properly. Then we have a line here that we placed earlier and we want to add some plaster under that line because it would be difficult for dirt and uh, vegetation to just sit there. So this would definitely be a rock face. Now, one thing you want to make sure you do is check your clearance when you're carving and adding uh, plaster to your portal. So you could use a uh, ON30 track gauge here, and you could see we're a little over on this side. So all you need to do is just carve away just a little bit, and you'll have enough clearance. Now, we took some material away, and we're going to check again to see if we're clear. And we're very close, so that's going to work for us. Okay, now we've come to a point where we want to see how our carvings paid off. And the best way to do that is to apply the wash that we're going to apply to color it. So this is Age It Easy Railroad Tie and Bridge Stain. And it's a gray-brown wash. And what it's going to do is not only color our rocks, it's going to tell us if we need to carve any more. So it's a good way to get a read on whether you've carved enough because once you apply it, you'll be able to see details that you haven't seen before, like all the hairline cracks start to come out. And as you could leave these rocks as is with just this wash, but we're going to do a couple other things after this to add a little more depth. And you can apply just one coat if you want, but if you uh, want a little darker, just keep applying more. Okay, the next step after we've stained our rock is to dry brush it with white paint. And we're going to use white acrylic paint like Polyscale Reefer White. And when we dry brush, we're taking as much paint off the brush as possible. And we're just going to drag it across the rock surface. And you can see how it highlights the edges. And you're not, so you're not actually painting the rock. You're barely scraping the surface. And this is yet another layer that helps bring out the details that you've gone through all the trouble to carve. And it's a very subtle effect, so you don't need to use very much and you don't need to apply very much. Okay, now we could leave the white dry brushing as is, but we want to add another layer to get as much uh, contrast and tonal change as possible. So we're taking polyscale earth 
and dry brushing it right on top of the white. And this doesn't have to be everywhere. We just want a little hint of a different color. And when you're making a rock work to a specific geographic region, you might want to do a little research and see what colors are uh, used in the rock in that area. Now, sometimes the color you put down uh, after the white might appear a little strong. And what you could do is just go back over the white. And what you're doing is just fading that color a little bit and blending it in even further. So you could go back and forth with colors as often as you want until you get the look that you're looking for. Okay, now our next layer of weathering is going to be through these weathering powders. And they come in a lot of colors, but we're going to sort of stick to the colors that we've used in our rock so far, which is dry brushing the white, the brown, and then uh, we're going to use black, but very, very little, um, probably hardly any at all. So we're going to use a, a, a wide fan brush, and these powders go a long way, so always start with the smallest amount possible. And where you're looking to apply them are in the undercuts, because what you're doing with the powder is creating a shadow. And these are Doc O'Brien's weathering powders. And in addition to the colors you see here, there are plenty of weathering colors and uh, colors you could use for weathering freight cars and other things in the same way. And just like the dry brushing, if you put on too much, you can take some white and just a very little bit and just blend it in. What you don't want is to look like it was brushed on. And the more you brush it, the more it'll soften up and blend into the cracks and, and so forth. The best thing to do is just do this for a few moments and then stop because if you go a little further, you're probably ending up end up using too much. And take a look, step back and take a look and see where you are. You know, there's another way to make really nice looking rocks on your model railroad, and that's to use plaster rock castings. Here are some examples here. They're made in rubber or latex molds. Here's an example of a mold here. And Woodland Scenics sells a line of molds. Uh, there are hobby shops that have their own brands and you can buy rock molds online. So what I like to do is to make a lot of little tiles. By a little tile I mean I took a rock mold and I didn't fill it. I filled it about a third or maybe even less than that to make this little teeny piece of rock that's got all of this detail on the surface and it has a very thin profile. And what I like to do is to apply these rocks, first of all art direct them, arrange them in the way I want to see them, and then apply them as if I was applying tile. So I use sculptor mold as a grout, I trowel it on, and then I press the rock castings into the sculptor mold and leave them. The sculptor mold acts like cement, it holds the castings in place, and then when it all dries I'll come back and paint it and I'll show you how I'm going to do that. What I've done here, I've mixed up some sculptor mold like we did when we mixed it up for the mountain that uh, was made out of plastic cloth. I've mixed it up, it's just there's no proportion with sculptor mold. You can follow the directions on the package. I just mix in enough water so that it works nicely. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to take these castings and I'm going to embed them in the sculptor mold. And let's start right here on the end. I'm going to have this rock face be right here. So the first thing I'm going to do is apply sculptor mold directly over my scenery base. And you can see we don't have to be real neat with this. We do need a bit of it on there just so that it acts as a bedding agent for the, for the casting. Now, these rock castings that I'm going to put on here I made yesterday and I made them out of hydrocal. They're still pretty damp. They still have a lot of water content in them. But one of the things I'm going to do is I'm going to spray the casting with water, just plain tap water, to wet it. Because when I push this in place here, 
I don't want the casting sucking all the moisture out of the sculptor mold because the sculptor mold won't set properly. So here's our first rock in place. So now I take a wet brush and I just dab the sculptor mold around the rock casting so that it blends it in place. As you can see, this is a very easy and a very controllable process. Now we're going to put in this second rock casting and I want it as close to the first one as possible. I want it right up in here. So what I'm going to do is trowel on a more sculptor mold. Okay, and we're going to take our casting like we did before and we're going to wet it and then I'm going to just push it into place. Alright, now that I have these two castings in place, and they look really nice here, I'm going to continue along. I'm going to place this one next. Now maybe I'll do, yeah, I'll do this one. And if the castings aren't the right shape, don't be afraid to take a pair of pliers and break off any areas to make the bottom smooth or to make them fit better. Because we can use almost every piece we break off. We can add this piece up in here between these two. So I'm going to keep going and uh, finish this rock face along here by the track. So here's our little rock face. I'm going to continue it as soon as I make some more rock castings. I used all of the castings I made yesterday so I'll make some more and then I'll finish this rock face down the length of our little hill here. And you can see how nice these castings blend into the sculptor mold. Now it's time to paint them. And the painting technique I'm going to use on these is different than the technique that Doug shows you that he likes. My technique is more about painting than staining. So I'm going to start with a color that I call scenery black. Scenery black is a mix of flat black and two parts earth. So what you get is a warm gray. And I paint the rocks with this warm gray color. And this is a base color. And what I'm doing really with this color is adding a primer coat to the scenery. And I'm sealing and filling in all of the shadows in the rock face. Now I've got my little hill here all built. I've got all the plastic castings in place and now I've put on a coat of scenery black. That's two parts earth to one part flat black. It's pa painted over the rocks. I'm going to allow that to dry and then I'm going to paint the rocks with four colors of polyscale paint. We're going to paint with, we're going to use rust, railroad tie brown, concrete and sand. And these four colors, you can duplicate almost any rock colors. We're also going to use reefer white at the end to dry brush the rocks. You'll also need a plastic container lid. This is going to be our palette. An inexpensive china bristle brush. And a pad of paper towel here to clean most of the paint off the brush with. I'll put about a teaspoon of each color in the lid. And I'm going to start by mixing railroad tie brown, rust, and a little concrete to make a reddish gray rock color. As you can see, this is not a lot brighter than the scenery black paint that I've put on here. Now you notice I'm not brushing the paint on. I'm just dabbing it on with the tip of the brush. Come back here. And you can see this is a very forgiving process. If you want the rocks to be a little redder, then take some of the sand and some of the rust and make yourself a pinker color and you see we can put this right on. You can put it on as just a band of color especially if you're modeling the southwest and there's a lot of layers of color, layers of sand. We could add a sedimentary layer. This, this may look a little too bright to you so go back in and just brush it down and I, by brushing it down I mean you take the brush and just push on it to spread it out a little bit to kind of diminish the intensity. Okay so we've added some colors to this we've lightened it up a little bit now I'm going to take the dirt 
and the concrete together to make a light gray color which is going to be the basic rock color and, and essentially what it is it's a color that's similar to the earth color that we put up here on the rocks now we're going to take this area this is on top and then we're going to make this just a little bit lighter so we're going to take a little bit of the concrete and a little bit of the sand and we're just going to brush this up here just to lighten it up what I'm looking for really up here is a color that's similar to the earth color we put on and we can make that color just by taking a little bit of the sand and a little bit of the rust and adding it up here Oops, a little too rusty and down to this area more of the same pick up some of the rail tie brown some of the earth now it's almost impossible to duplicate the colors that you created on the first rocks that you painted but you can get pretty close and the variety of color of the rocks is really important the variety of color is what makes them look realistic now you get the hang of it pretty much that's about all there is to it except when we finish them with dry brushing I should start by saying that the brush itself should be dry when you start you don't want any moisture on the brush because it'll it'll make the dry brushing smear on the rock surface what I've done I've taken some reefer white you don't have to use reefer white you can use any white acrylic paint you can use craft store paints if you like I put some on this brush so I'm gonna start by just I'll put a little bit of white just on the top surfaces of of these rocks and I'm brushing top to bottom the way light would fall on the rock and depending on the kind of paint you use as I said you can use any kind of white acrylic paint for this if you use tube acrylics they tend to be very sticky so what you get you get another texture as you drag the brush across the surface of the rock casting because the texture of the paint tends to stick to the surface of the castings you can see how this technique brings out all the detail in the rock surface and there's a lot of detail you'd never see if you just painted the rocks and didn't dry brush them so that's my technique for installing rock castings and then painting them